All right, uh, welcome to the uh, last session of today. Thanks for uh, coming here instead of uh, hitting the casino. I appreciate it. Um, I will get you in out in time for the Dodgers game, for those that care. So uh, my name is Daniel Egan, and today we're going to be talking about uh, building bots, uh, and we're going to kind of focus on uh, enterprise bots in, in the talk. Now, this talk today is not a, uh, I'm going to show code, um, it's part beginner, part advanced, uh, part concept, part what you should do, part, part what you shouldn't do. I'm not going to sit up here and walk you through step by step in building a bot. That's what this is for. So if you want to, after this, go build your own bot, I have a node uh, bot workshop and a C-sharp bot, bot workshop that takes you step by step by step to building your bot. And it gets you to the point where whatever your idea is, you can go from there. Um, you can find it on my GitHub, just github.com, Daniel Egan, uh, bot workshop. So bots are hotter than you could possibly imagine. Um, it's super crazy right now. Uh, we do a lot of work with a lot of different companies in our, in our roles, and every single one of them wants a bot. Um, we'll kind of talk about different ones they want and ones that are hot, but this is a great opportunity, uh, either internally in your company or if you're a consultant. Um, so many people either want a brand bot or an enterprise bot or a fun bot or whatever it is. There's just a huge opportunity in this space. It's easy to do, and what I mean by that is if you're a Node developer or you're a C-sharp developer, there's a really small learning curve for this stuff. Um, you already have most of the skills you need to build bots, and there's just a ton of opportunity. So I like to uh, usually start out, if I can, uh, with a little bot history. And you can see I titled it, What's Old is New Again, because I find it fascinating. Um, all these newfangled things are never really new. Um, they've been around for a long, long time, they just started hitting at the right spot. So uh, chatbots are the same way. So chatbots start way back with this guy. Can anyone tell me who he is? I've only had one person guess it. This is Lord Byron. Uh, and Lord Byron, um, if you don't know who he is, you probably know his book, uh, Don Juan. Uh, Lord Byron was a poet, and he was a scoundrel. Um, he actually had a daughter, and he left uh, when she was about four months old, and he was a womanizer. And um, because he was such a scoundrel, his wife took their daughter and decided that she's going to make sure that she does not turn out like her dad. And so she has mathematic tutor after mathematic tutor after mathematic tutor teach her mathematics to make sure she's driven to this side, the mathematics side, and not to the poetry side. Now, Her name was Augusta By Byron, um, and in July of 1835, she married William Eighth Baron King, and in 1838, he became the Earl of Lovelace, and she became Augusta Ada King Noel Countess of Lovelace, or as you probably know her, Ada Lovelace. Um, this is kind of, I guess, where the story really begins. So Ada Lovelace, since she had all that uh, mathematics training, she had a really cool and interesting relationship with a gentleman named Charles Babbage. Uh, Charles Babbage is known as the father of the computer, and he, he's famous for two different things. Uh, the first one was a difference engine, which he actually did build, and this could calculate uh, equations faster than any human could. Um, it's just a, a glorified calculator uh, made with mechanics you know, way back in the day. Uh, and then he also designed, but never built, uh, something called the analytical engine. Uh, the analytical engine was the first programmable computer, so it wasn't designed for just one simple thing. And so he asked Ada Lovelace, since they were friends and she was a mathematician, um, to write comments on a paper that uh, another mathematician had written on the analytical engine. And when she did it, she wrote notes on it that were probably seven times the size of the actual paper. And uh, there's a lot of fascinating things in there um, about uh, Ada Lovelace and computer industry and all this stuff. But very specifically, in that paper, one of the things that Ada said is that computers could never have artificial intelligence. It was absolutely impossible. Now, this irked a bunch of people. Uh, one of them that it irked is uh, Alan Turing. Uh, he's considered the father of artificial intelligence. 
uh, Alan Turing uh, devised what's called the Turing test. Uh, the Turing test is really simple. You put a computer in one room, you put a person in a second room, and then another person in the third room. And if person A cannot figure out if he's talking to a computer or a person, it's said to have passed the Turing test and it's said to have uh, intelligence. Now, way back in 1964 at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, they built the first chatbot. So everyone's really hot on this bot stuff right now and chatbots right now, but chatbots have been around since 1964. Uh, the first chatbot was called Eliza, um, and it was a therapist. And if you think about how a therapist talks, it says stuff like, what do you think about that? How does that make you feel? You know, those kind of roundabout questions that you'd think could possibly help, you know, someone pass the Turing test. Um, the second chatbot is Perry, and Perry was a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, and if you can imagine what a paranoid schizophrenic sounds like, they can really say anything, right? So it's another thing that um, they built to, to pass the Turing test. And of course, since you have a therapist and a paranoid schizophrenic, they had to meet at one point. Um, so they met over the ARPNET, and uh, this is the discussion they've had. Uh, so chatbots are really cool, really neat, um, but have been around for a long, long time. But they weren't very useful. And the reason they weren't very useful is because bots were like text-based adventure games. How many people uh, have ever played a text-based adventure game? Oh, it's a good, good crowd. Uh, so if you played one, you know you had to say things like turn left, open doorknob, walk west, you know, whatever the commands were. And if you said anything outside of that, it had no idea what you're talking about. Chatbots were and can still be exactly the same thing. So if I write a chatbot and you're using it, it doesn't really matter what it was, is, and you ask it a question, it says, I don't know what you're talking about, can you ask it again? And so you ask again, you say, I don't know what you're talking about, can you ask again? And you ask it again, it says, I don't know what you're talking about, can you ask it again? Now, you're getting annoyed at me right now because I just said it three times, right? Now, if your bot's doing that to people, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to be annoyed. They're not going to use it. It's not going to work. And this is why bots didn't work until now. NLP to the rescue. And one important thing about NLP is you need to, uh, if you're going to look up NLP, which is natural language processing, at the end of this, make sure you type out natural language processing. Because if you do a search for NLP, you'll find neuro-linguistic programming. Completely different and not what you want. Well, you may want it, but it has nothing to do with chatbots. So why is NLP so hard? Uh, I use this uh, statement all the time, or this uh, sentence all the time, to kind of explain it. Um, you see this, I saw a man on a hill with a telescope. It seems like a simple statement, but it can mean many things. There's a man on a hill, and I'm watching him with my telescope. There's a man on a hill I'm seeing, and he has a telescope. There's a man, and he's on a hill that also has a telescope on it. Or I'm on a hill, and I saw a man using a telescope. It's really difficult for computers to understand our natural language. To be able to talk to a human is really, really difficult. And that's why you had that text-based adventure you know, game scenario, where if you didn't say it exactly like the regular expression, command, whatever, that it understood, it was out of scope. If you look at this more in a real world-ish scenario, the same thing happens. So, see the first line, has my order number 1549 been shipped yet? That one might be relatively easy to parse. Uh, but if you look at the third one down, do you sell Acer laptops and drives? Am I asking, do you sell Acer laptops and Acer drives? Or Acer laptops and also drives? So it's, it gets really difficult. And the thing you need to do is two things when you're dealing with natural language. One is derive the intent of the question and pull out any entities you need. So if you look at the bottom question, what kind of display is on a Surface 4? Uh, this is something I've been uh, working on for the Surface uh, seller teams um, so they can, and this is, a core thing for enterprise bots, is what I term them enterprise bots, is if you think about a call center, any call center anywhere, it doesn't matter about the industry, you get the same hundred or thousand questions again and again 
and again and again. And so if you can have a layer that can handle those questions that come in and again, you can not only save the company money, um, but you can put uh, resources to better use. You know, people have always been like, oh, if you automate things, it's going to put people out of work. And it never really does, not in our industry, you know, maybe automobile industry where they're, you know, using machines to build cars and stuff like that. But in all my years of automating stuff, it's never generated a layoff of one single person and stuff I've automated, you know, back pre-internet days and stuff. So if we look at the last one, the things I'm going to pull out of this is display. That's the, f it's basically this question, I can tell it's asking about a feature, uh, and the entity is Surface 4. So how you do that with our stack is called Lewis. It's the Language Understanding Intelligent Services, and it's part of our cognitive services, which is part of the Cortana Intelligent Suite uh, on top of that. Um, but the Language un uh, Understanding Intelligent Service allows you to be able to get this information to determine intent and to find entities. And I'm actually going to show you. I have that there in case Wi-Fi was down. So I've already created an app. I'm not going to walk you through every little step. One of the beautiful parts about this is there's no programming involved in this. All the uh, heavy lifting is done by Microsoft. And what I mean by that is um, whenever you're doing a machine learning type of thing, the biggest thing you need is data. And if you can imagine the amount of data that we ingest in things like Bing and the way people answer questions and all that stuff, you have that power under this. And so it's really simple. You create a new app, which I've created the service bot. You define uh, intents uh, and entities over here. So you just create an intent. Um, for this one, it's a pared down version of the main one. I have, are they asking about features? Do they need help? Are they asking about a price? Are they asking about a specific promotion? Right? And then what you do is you train it. And you train it by asking questions. Um, so he, here's, I can type some more here, um, but here's some questions that I've asked and trained it with before. And you can see the labels that it uses. Um, but if you want to see what I actually asked, I'll bring up the tokens. You can see, does the Surface 3 have Gorilla Glass? Does, what kind of display is on a Surface 3? Is there a keyboard on a Surface 2? Etc. And you do that for each of your intents. Now, one of the things you'll notice is uh, it was really difficult to do before. Is I'm combining one thing with two words, you know, Surface Three or Surface Four. So when I train it, it understands that that is one entity that I want to use. And what this uh, basically does at the end, it's a service that you point to, and it'll send you back JSON. It'll send you back what it thinks the intent is, and any entities that you need. And as a developer, if you have those two pieces of data, that's just a database call now, right? So now you're able to have people ask things any way they want. You know, there's so many different ways to ask the same question, and you train it, and, and it gets smarter over time. As you have more and more users continue to use it, it gets smarter and smarter and smarter. And this right here is why bots are relevant now, why bots can do the things that they can do now. So one of the, this is kind of a layered talk, and I'll come back to this again, but Lewis is implemented uh, as an intent recognizer, which means it implements the uh, iIntent interface. And this is really important when you're really going to design a production bot. Uh, I'll show, I'm going to show you some code at the end that is really very close to how you should have your production bot. Because all the samples, fortunately or unfortunately, will um, have stuff kind of generically. Because you have to build samples that way to teach people uh, s certain concepts. Um, and this is a really important concept. So the intent recognizer stack is in the node uh, SDK only, um, but I use something called scorables, which you'll see later. And what this allows you to do, and I, I want to mention it here and I'll mention it again, is if you think of the traffic um, for a bot, if you think of asking a bot a question and for every single question having to go to Lewis and come back, 
go to Lewis and come back for every single one. You don't want to do that for a couple reasons. For the price, it's, it's very minimal going up, but if you have a super popular bot, you're going to pay for each one. And then also the traffic lag, right? So if you can teach people to say a command, like, next time, ask me this way, and capture that locally, and then answer the question, you save that time and you save that money. It's called stacking intents, and I'll show you that later. Um, it's a really important concept. So when people first start to play with natural language processing, they really tend to abuse it. Uh, and I completely understand why, because it's fun. You know, building bots, we've all probably done development jobs that pay the bills, and then development jobs that are really fun to do. And working with bots and working with natural language processing is really fun. Um, but what they do is they kind of go out of scope, meaning that one of the worst things you can do, and you'll see this in a bunch of bots if you start using them, uh, that a lot of bots will do this, it'll come up and say, hi, how can I help you? That is completely open-ended, right? I just found you. I have no idea what you can help me with, right? So you want to make sure you don't abuse NLP by trying to answer that one question and have a million different intents and a thousand entities to try and capture everything under the sun. And we'll talk about narrowing that down in a second. The second thing is users never ask things the way you as a developer thinks or think they're going to ask things. You know, you start planning your head of this house application, you're like, okay, they'll probably ask, you know, I want a house with four bedrooms and, and I want it to be th between 300 and 350 and I needed to have a big yard and you need to have, they're not going to say that. They're going to say, I want to buy a house. And you have to answer that question. And so you've got to realize that they're not going to ask it the way you wish they would ask it. And actually, I don't know where rent-wise uh, this person lives, but a four-bedroom house for 300 to $350. Um, not where I live, anyway. So the other side of it, this, and we'll, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into this directed and non-directed, is leading them through a path. So you want to give them options, or at least show them what you're good at, right? So when they come to your, to your bot, it's like a website. When they come to your bot, they say, hey, how are you? What can I help you with? These are the things I can do, right? That's called directed. And there's this uh, line in the sand that's not very well defined called directed or non-directed. Directed is, can be slightly boring, but it gets the job done. And what I mean by that is all you do is buttons, right? I can help you with these three things. You click on a button, we're typing what the button says. Now answer this question. Now answer that question it gets to where you need to go and it, it helps them um, get the information they're looking for, but it's kind of boring. The opposite side is what we just talked about, non-directed, leaving it wide open and letting them go crazy uh, with how they ask things. That, as you know, as developers, is really difficult. It's like leaving a text box on your forms where people can type in everything, right? You usually have check boxes or drop downs because you want to control the, the data that's coming in. So you need to decide where in that line, how directed and how non-directed you want your bot to be. Because as you think about it, they're funnels. If you think of what Lewis does, you're just allowing the natural language processor to funnel it into a bucket that you understand that you can make decisions on. So what makes a bot great? Uh, it's not how smart they are. Um, it's not how much NLP they have. It's the user experience. The best ones make it really easy. One of the difficult things for building bots uh, is you, you're going to want to have a lot of fun. And when you're having a lot of fun, you're going to do stuff to make the experience harder. When you build a bot to do a process that maybe a website or something else is, gonna, is already doing, you want to make sure the bot is making it easier for them, uh, not harder. And one of the things that does that is make sure your bot has a clear purpose. It's got to have a very specific purpose. If you look at these bots that are already out there, Expedia you know, allows you to book travel. You know exactly what that's going to do. Fandango you know, will help you buy tickets. 1-800-Flowers, you know, buy flowers. 
And that one's actually pretty cool because it does proactive stuff. Um, we won't have time to get into that, but it, it'll talk to me even when I'm not talking to it. If I've already engaged the 1-800 flowers bot and then go to the website to buy flowers, it'll then send me a message later. Oh, thanks for your purchase. Is there anything else we can help you with inside the messenger I'd used to contact it before? Right, so that's really cool. Or, you know, down the pizza bot to get pizza. Or if you use them all at once, it's like a date night, you know, using bots, right? Uh, so make sure it has a clear purpose. One of the most interesting ones in, along that em enterprise theme is the uh, Azure bot. Now this is up there and you can download the code and do it. And it seems like it's, you know, a demo that really doesn't have a clear purpose. But if you think about what this Azure bot can do, it's very smart. So th if you are the person at your work that's in charge of all the VMs that are running in your company and you're out to dinner with your family and something's going crazy on the VMs and you need to figure stuff out, are you going to open up your phone because your wife or husband, significant other did not uh, allow you to bring your laptop to dinner, right? So you're going to open up your phone and try and VPN in and try and click that blade to see your VMs, right, and all that stuff. But with the Azure bot, you could just, uh, after you're authenticated, just say, list all my VMs. It gives you a list of VMs, shut down this VM. A really great use case for a very simple bot that does something really cool and powerful. One of the things bots can do, and this is where the enterprise is really using these, is to improve workflows. We touched on call centers uh, a little bit at the beginning of this, but it gets a little deeper than just those thousand you know, questions, questions that it can answer again and again and again. And one of the things that I run up against is, um, you know, I'm, I just turned 50, so there's a certain um, level of uh, people that maybe don't use uh, Messenger, they don't use Skype or Slack or Kick or uh, any of the, the chat interfaces, but there's a whole group of people that do and actually prefer to do it. There is a, there is a, a time you know, in my life where people are like, I want to talk to a human. Maybe because the frustration of the phone tree gave that to you. But m messengers and bots are different. People don't mind. If it handles the problem, they don't mind doing it. Um, and this is a great case for it. You know, if you're you know, calling your cable company or uh, you know, messaging your cable company or your phone company or any company you work with, um, it allows them to triage stuff so that people down the line can have all the information ready and get the answered quest questions answered. Um, if it's simple and repetitive, that's what we talked about, it can answer it itself. If it uh, can't, what it will do is take the complex ones and escalate it to a person that can handle it with all the information you've already given them. Um, the more compelling case, or very interesting case to me, and we've worked on a, a couple of these, is this case right here. If you think about, and we've all had this experience where you've called customer service, and just like any other industry, there's turnover. And you find yourself talking to a, a junior person in customer service, and you're like, Yes, I've already rebooted. Yes, it's plugged in. Yes, and I, I feel for them because if you're brand new in that job, there's only so much you can learn, whatever the industry is, before you're thrown on those phones, right? You've read all the manuals and all that stuff, but you're going crazy. This is a great experience because what this is, is a bot listening in to that messaging coming across. The bot has access to all the manuals all the information, and so as those questions come in, they're talking to a human, but the bot can intercede and say, I think they're doing this, and suggest courses of action for you. It's a better experience for that new employee, it's a better experience for the customer, right? And it helps train them up um, moving forward. And you can see you can give it different uh, ways to do it. You know, the one, one is just, uh, for speed to suggest this and it'll type it for you, right? Or let me type if you want, if the uh, person wants to take over and, and type whatever they want. So let's talk about bot facts. Number one is users love buttons. Um, people will uh, 
like being able to do both, and that's an interesting part of uh, using messaging apps is you can have buttons and drop downs and all that that show up in carousels that show up. But people, if they are more comfortable typing the word out, if you give me a list of stuff, I can either click on that button to choose that or I can type in what that button says. But users like buttons, especially if you think of on phone, right? If they can press a button and go to the next step, it's, it's much easier. Uh, text is second. And voice is third. As cool um, as it is, as cool as that technology is, it's really difficult to, um, there's, there's a lot of pieces down that line that make that whole process difficult from the understanding of the speech coming through, which we have some cognitive services to that, to the way you speak is not as clear as what you type. And you may not realize that until you start building a bot that they want voice. You know, the way people say stuff really quick instead of type, you're much clearer when you type out what you want. Um, so that's usually third. Users never say things the way you expect them. We talked about that already. And search can do wonders for bots. One of the reasons I have this on here is we talked about stacking intents. Um, we talked about, you know, being able to go to Lewis or doing commands. But these two things are really amazing. So the uh, Q&A maker, if you want, if your company right now has, uh, how many, I should actually ask the question, how many of you are at a company that has an FAQ page somewhere on their website? Okay, and no one ever, ever uses it, right? Because they're really hard to navigate, especially, you know, maybe if you have 10 FAQs, it's not hard, but they usually have 100 FAQs. What the Q&A maker does is it automatically reads and parses your FAQ from your site. It puts in, it's not Lewis, but there's a natural language processor on the front end that allows people to ask questions in natural language that will find the questions in your FAQs and give them those answers. Uh, and the Q&A maker allows you to tweak it and test it and all that stuff. And you can use it alone, right? But the way I like to use it is as a f uh, fail safe. So if I'm not able to answer the question they're asking in my bot in any process I'm going through, I'll have that in the intent rec or at the bottom. I didn't find an answer and I'll go see if it's in the FAQs, right? So you can use it alone. And then as your search too, if you have uh, information that is um, just thousands and thousands and thousands of rows, uh, Azure Search does a great job of being able to use, you know, the technology that we use like in Bing to put it for your data. Bots do not need to have conversations. One of the things you don't want to do when you're building your bot is try to pass the Turing test. You're not trying to trick the user. You're trying to just help the user. So make sure that you're not doing things to try and seem like you're a real person because people will catch on because they'll know you're not a real person and then they won't like your bot. So make sure that you're not trying to do that. Okay, so now let's talk about the bot framework itself. It's three pieces, kind of one piece. Uh, the bot directory is just where you can publish your bot so that other people can find it. There's other bot directories as well. This is, you know, one we own. Uh, the developer portal, which we'll probably look at a little bit, is where you put things, uh, where you do two things. You uh, say where your bot's hosted. And the thing to realize for your bot is it's just a website. So you decide basically where to host it, right? So if it's on Azure, if it's on your servers, if it's, you know, somewhere else, um, you, you're putting that URL, right? We need to know where it is so that we can contact it. Um, and it's also where you connect the channels, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a little bit. And then the bot builder. So there's three ways to access the bot framework. One is the uh, Node SDK. One is the C-sharp SDK, and we'll look at both of those today. Um, and the third way is REST. I suggest you use one of the first two, because with, like with any API, you want all the goodies that are built in that API if you're hitting a REST service, all the, what I call uh, code rails that you get um, with the APIs, you don't get with the REST, but you can access it via REST service. So this is what a typical bot looks like. Your code is just a really small part of it. Um, and again, like I said in the beginning, you already have the skills. 
whether you're a C-sharp developer or no developer. Um, you're just this very small learning curve. Uh, because what you're doing is usually calling out. A question comes in, you parse it using Lewis, you're going to go to your database, or you're going to go to cognitive services, you're going to go to this API, you're going to go to the phone tree API, whatever it is, right? That's all external stuff. So you're really just directing stuff. As long as you can understand what they're asking, you're just getting answers, right? It's that simple. <clears throat> the big thing is the channels on, on the side there. And so let's talk about channels. When I say channels, there's different ways for people to communicate with your bot. And channels are things like Skype or Slack or Teams or SMS or Kick uh, or uh, Twilio for SMS or email, um, Bing, uh, Cortana. And this is the beautiful part of our bot fr framework is you write it once and you can have it on all these channels. I've done this talk before to user groups in different places and they're like, man, I wish this was here when I built my bot. Because if you build a Facebook bot, and then you want to build a Slack bot, you have to build it over again. And then if you want to build a Kick bot, you have to build it again. Now, if you architected it correctly, you know, you'll have some shared code, obviously, but you have to build it again and again and again. And what the bot framework does, this allows you to build it once and have it almost instantly in all of them. There's some slight caveats to that, meaning some channels will format things a little different and you have to you know, tweak it a bit. Um, but it's pretty, pretty close to turnkey on that. And how it does that is it uses a connector service. And so you can imagine all the uh, uh, chat frameworks did not sit down in a room and go, let's call this field first name, let's call this last name, let's call it, you know, they're all different, right? So, I mean, some might match, but they have their own fields. They ha that's how they built their API. So what we built was a connector service. So um, the channel, if say it's sending a message back, will come with its own JSON into the connector service. We translate it to something that the bot framework understands so we can handle it. Same thing coming back. It takes whatever's coming, we call it activity JSON, sends it through the connector service, says what channel is it on? Oh, this is what these fields are, and it sends it back. So that's how it you know, can communicate to all these channels at once. And more keep coming. One of the reasons I stop and really talk about the power of the connector service is because if you build a bot in C-sharp, you won't notice. It's just that one line of code that's doing all that beautiful work for you. Um, it's kind of just hitting and hitting in that using statement up on top. Uh, same thing for Node. You might understand it a bit more because you have to type it out, uh, but same thing. That's, that's the connecting service uh, in Node. So let's, uh, let's look at a bot. So first of all, um, let's just do a new. If you do file new project, uh, you will not have bot application in there. You will have to download the template and drop it in your project templates for it to show up. If you did this a long time ago and you've never played with it, delete it and get the new one because they've changed it a bit. But we're just going to go click that and click OK. And we will let that spin up. And we're going to go to the controller. Let's build this. So it's really pretty simple. It's going to uh, hit an endpoint wherever you're ho uh, hosting it, slash API, slash, slash messages, right? That's the messages controller. So whenever a message hits that endpoint, and what I mean by a message is text someone types into a chat. Even if it's a button, the button's converted to, to text that goes in there. It goes through here. Um, this is that, you know, like I said, activity.json. 99% of the time, the type is going to be uh, of message, which is just that text. And then there's some other things that can come through, uh, system messages, uh, things like these two are the only ones you're really going to use. Uh, contact 
relationship update. That means if you are in Skype and someone uh, adds your bot uh, as a contact, this will fire and you can decide to do something. Thanks for adding me, blah, 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 right? Uh, con conversation update is the other one. One of the key things you should do for your bot is address the user right away. And what I mean by that is you don't want someone to load up your bot in a, in a whatever the channel is in Facebook or Kick or Slack or Skype and just sit there. Because it's a response system. You have to ask it something and then it responds. And so the way you fix that is there's something called conversation update. It fires twice, once when the bot enters the conversation, once when the user enters the conversation. So you want to capture when the user enters the conversation and you send a message back that says, hi, welcome to my bot. How can I help you? I can help in these ways, right? Um, the rest of them are just going to be here, a message, and when it finds the message, it's going to send it to the root dialog. And we'll talk about dialogues uh, in a little bit here. Uh, you can see the root dialog here. If we look at node, bring that up. open that. And I just learned how to do that in Jeremy's session last time. Actually, I already knew how to do that because Jeremy taught me. OK, so if we look at a basic bot um, for Node, we'll just look at this ho hello world. It's even simpler. You know, uh, Visual Studio is fantastic, C Sharp's fantastic, but you saw that plumbing in C Sharp that had to happen. So this is that same type of bot in, in uh, Node. And the only thing that's a slightly different that I like to keep in here because I like to test uh, newer things in it. See on line three, instead of it being a chat connector, which is what you'd use in your uh, production bot, it's a console connector. So uh, it'll be on the console and I can talk back and forth with it. Um, and you just change that one line right there later on once you're to the point you want to do. Um, and everything works the same way. So this is the root dialog in Node. You know, it's just the basically default. You know, it's routing. And so let's look at run both of them. Let's actually run this one. Node. Hello world JS. And I'm not capturing anything, so just like I said, it's just sitting there waiting for me to say something. So I say hello, it says hello world. I say gobbledygook. It just keeps saying hello world. And the reason it says that is that's all I'm capturing. I have that one root thing and all it's saying is hello world back. If we do the same thing for the Visual Studio application. the second to spin up. Um, it's going to spin it up and run it on localhost 3979. Remember, you have to append this with API slash messages when you talk to it. There's an emulator that you can download that allows you to test locally. I thought I had that spun up, but that'll take a second to come up. You put in your endpoint, uh, which was 3979, API slash messages. And I'm saying that five times because you will put in this URL and wonder why your bot's not working, API slash messages. We don't right now, uh, we haven't set it up on the bot framework, so we don't have an app ID or an app password for this bot yet, so we can just do connect. And you'll notice down here that two conversation updates, one when the bot enters, one when I enter. I'm not handling it yet, um, but if I say hello on this one, uh, in the root dialog for that one, all it's doing is taking what I say and saying how many characters it is. Right? So, so pretty simple. So let's talk about dialogues. Dialogues, and this is where I, I'm... Yes, you have permission. 
dialogues are just a conversation back and forth. Uh, they're just a, uh, a method. Um, so user says, hi, uh, I'm Dinnerbot, how can I help you? I'd like to reserve a table. Great, let's get started. It's a conversation between you and the bot. Um, and you do that in dialogue. But you have to understand, and I think people uh, gravitate to this more, is you want to break up dialogues into different files. And what I mean by that is you have uh, dialogues that will handle a very specific action. One of those actions is getting user info. So you can see here, I want to see if we already have the user's info, because that's something you'll want to do, because I don't want to have to, for two reasons. One, if I come back to the bot again, it's nice if they say, hey, Daniel, welcome back. Or if you know, I had asked for my birthday, hey, it's your birthday today, happy birthday. Whatever it is, credit card information, um, or whatever information your bot needs, you want to be able to uh, gather that. So I can see if I already have it, if I don't, I'm going to go to the, the Get Information dialog, and then I'll go to the Reservation dialog. If I already know who they are, then I'm going to go to the Reservation dialog. So you want to separate each dialog to be specific function. And you basically stack the dialogs. The root dialog, which you'll see, should really be uh, a traffic manager. It comes in there. What are they asking? I'm going to send it to the dialog that can handle it. And I'll show you the, the code behind dialogs in a, in a minute. This builds a dialogue chain. So you can see you know, introduction dialogue, user info dialogue, reservation dialogue. And it plays right along with how you persist data. So per persisting data in the bot framework is you have user data to store data specific to that user, like we just talked about, uh, name, you know, birth date, whatever. Conversation data is so information that's happening during that conversation. Uh, private conversation data is, uh, in many mediums, you can have multiple people in a conversation. So is that, is that information specific to one user in the conversation or to all the users in the conversation? Um, and then dialogue data. You need to persist some data just while you're still in that dialogue. Now, by default, this data is saved on uh, Azure. Um, not in your Azure account, in Bot Framework's Azure account, uh, so to speak. Um, but what you should do for your production bot is implement the iState interface. And when you do that, then you just save this data wherever you'd like to. You can, of course, leave it uh, and have it stored in, in uh, Azure. But most people want to store their, their own information. So if you think of dialogues like screens, if you're used to writing um, web pages and you're used to you know, creating screens for them, it's, it's kind of the same concept. You have your main screen and then it has, you know, I have a screen that captures the user information, then I have a screen that helps them reserve a table at my restaurant, etc. So let's look at those dialogues. We already saw the Node.js dialog, so I'm just going to show you the one in C-sharp. So for, it, for you to be able to work with a dialog, you need to do a couple things. One is it's got to be serializable. It's got to implement the iDialog interface, um, passing something back. Um, a lot of times it's just a generic object, object but when you um, go from one dialog back to the one that just called it, sometimes you want to pass data, and sometimes you don't. So that would be whatever the object is, the reservation object that passes back. Um, you can see that um, the only uh, thing you need to implement is uh, start a sync. And then when it jumps into here, it'll go to message received a sync. And in here, you do your activity. Now, this one, as you saw, was very simple. Um, it's just going to grab uh, whatever they said and uh, send it back to the user uh, with the message. Uh, and that's it. Um, but usually what this does is you don't want to do this in the root. Usually what you do is call out to another dialog, come back, call out to another dialog. That dialog might need to get information. Does that make sense? You're stacking the dialogs. And stacking the dialogs <clears throat> is an important point to, to pause on, because this is another thing I found trips people up. It's a really easy thing to not do. 
when you're done in a dialogue, you have to explicitly say end dialogue. If you don't say end dialogue, your bot is sitting and waiting inside that dialogue. And so if your root dialogue is the one that routes them to whatever answers it, and you're sitting in this dialogue, you'll spend time going, why isn't my bot working? So I always pause to say to make sure you end dialogue. And when you end dialogue, it takes it off the stack. And of course, if you want it and you can, you can replace dialogue. You can actually wipe out the stack so it goes back down to the root dialogue. Just like say they wanted to um, type the word cancel. So when they type the word cancel, you wipe them all out, right? You don't have to go back. So there's a bunch of ways to do it, but make sure you end the dialogues. <clears throat> Let me see here. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, form flow. Uh, form flow is I have a uh, love, not so love relationship with Formflow. It's an amazing addition, in my opinion, to the bot framework uh, with some caveats. And so I want to make sure I point out those caveats. But Formflow is only available in C Sharp, but it, it helps you do something really easily. And this is what it helps you with. So here's what you'd think a conversation would go. You know, what date would you like your reservation for? 12, 14, 17. For how many people? For what time? That's a normal flow, but as you know, this is actually what happens. What date would you like to reservation for? 12, 14, 70. For how many people? Wait, I mean 2, 14, 17. The bot's already passed. The bot's already gone, right? So it's, it has no idea what you're talking about because you're giving it an answer to the last question when it's on the current question. And so form flow helps you do that. <clears throat> and it does it rather easily. Uh, if you're a C-sharp developer, this will come really natural to you. So if you have a set of questions that you know you want to ask, like reserving a table, and it's a good, finite, uh, simple set of questions, all you need to do is create a class that holds them. So you can do an enum if it's a multiple choice thing. Um, you can see that I have a, a string for name, string for email. I have a phone number, and you can see I have a pattern in there, regular expression, to make sure it validates uh, to a uh, phone number. Um, the email, you can see I'm not doing that because I can do that a different way uh, later. Um, <clears throat> what you then have is uh, something called a build form, and the build form allows you to take that class that you created and now build it to ask the questions. And you could very simply, if you see uh, add remaining fields, I could just start with that. If I've set up my class exactly how I want it in the order I want it in, that's really all I have to do. It'll ask the questions in the order that it is in the class. But if I want to designate, well, maybe I wanted to ask this question first, or if I wanted to do something like you can see here with email, I want to validate email. So I can validate it with a regular expression in the class, or I can have it jump out to that validate method down below to validate it. I can do you know, cool stuff like that. The, and then what <clears throat> you get from that is when you're working with it, you can say, what time would you like to arrive? At any time, you can say, help. And it'll tell you where you are. It'll allow you to jump to any question you want. It'll tell you what answers you've already done. So it handles that situation. and does all that wrapping code for you. So for very cool, simple uh, flows, form flow works great. The caveat is as soon as you break out into something form flow can't handle, you have to write it all over. Because there's no like extension to the form flow dialogue stuff. You have to, you know, create the flow yourself going into other dialogues. So use it for very simple stuff, uh, but make sure you know there's a, a caveat. So that's where my love not so love relationship it, with with it is. What's that? Where? So, so it says, what time would you like to arrive? It said today. What time would you like to arrive? Okay. No, no, because I said, because I said help, it automatically went back to that same question again. Yeah, it'll also handle, um, if I said next Wednesday, it understands the context and will grab that date, stuff like that. 
So let's uh, talk about uh, real world uh, examples. We got a little bit of time left. I have two I want to show you. Uh, how many people are node developers in here? Okay, and C Sharp? Okay, I'll do both. I'll start, um, I'll start with node uh, and then kind of show the difference. Uh, and this is something uh, Jeremy and I worked on. Because one of the things you'll see in the samples is everything, if you're no developer, like everything, all the dialogues are in waterfalls and, and all the waterfall is, uh, is an array of functions that keep jumping down to the next one, answer this question, jump down to the next one. And everything is in app.js or server.js. It's a huge, huge file. And if you're a no developer, that's you know, definitely not something you want to do. And so what this does, and Jeremy actually has a uh, really crazy, more advanced version of what I'm going to show you, but this is a little easier to visualize. So all the dialogues are separated out here into different uh, files. So it's very specific, and if you have multiple developers working on this project, it's very easy for them to not to step on their toes. If you are uh, supposed to do the product search dialog, and you are supposed to do the uh, you know, smile back dialogue, you guys aren't in app.js stepping on each other's toes. So what you do is you define Sorry, let me get back there, app.js. You define all the dialogues that you want to use, and you set them here. Um, this is where you're just uh, connecting to the server. You can see that I'm using the chat connector now uh, instead of the one I was using earlier. Um, this is, we're using Restify. You don't have to use Restify, but uh, by default we use Restify to create the server to serve the bot. Um, here's our default, uh, that actually default git. Um, you can see here where this is the same in C Sharp where you have API messages and uh, we're going to use the connector to listen for incoming calls to that endpoint. Here is where we uh, stack intents. So there's just a couple in this one, but we have uh, greetings, smiles, and then the Lewis recognizer. And what this does is it'll go through each of, each of them. So greetings are if someone just says hi, or hello, or what's up, or any of those things that they try and tease a bot with, you don't want to have to go to Lewis to do that. So you can catch those phrases and say hi back, and say yo back, or say whatever you want back. Same thing for emoticons. If, if they put in an emoticon, you don't want to have to go to Lewis to figure out that it is. You can determine that it is one, and you can send a smile back, right? So you're capturing these things. One I don't have on here that uh, we use all the time is commands. So once you go to Lewis and you figure out the intent they have, you say next time use this keyword. It'll be caught in commands and then you know same flow, it'll answer questions. And then you see there on the bottom is the Lewis recognizer um, and the Lewis recognizer uh, was, will be the stuff coming back from Lewis um, that you can handle, pull out the intents and the entities. And then here uh, for Lewis is how you match those intents. So this is the same thing whether I've created the intent file or we're using Lewis intents. If the intent matches greeting, or if it matches product search or reset, it's going to go to that corresponding dialog. So this is how you should set up a node one. If we look at uh, C sharp, wrong color. We don't have the same thing, and I don't have this code up there yet. I have to clean this up because it's been kind of uh, test projects and stuff, but there's a really good learnings in here. Uh, the first one is if you build uh, and utilize Lewis, one of the things you'll notice is that you have to put an attribute up here uh, with the Lewis model ID and your subscription ID. And as you can tell, if you're checking this into source code, you're now checking your keys in the source code. And since it's an attribute, you can't easily just hide it in another file that's not checked in. 
Um, I don't have time to go into what we did, but it is in the solution, and I'll put it up in that bot workshop thing so you guys can use. Um, but it pulls it out of there. That's uh, something you want to do. The second thing is, um, in this project, and I'll have both, I have a root dialog and a root score dialog. So what I'm using is uh, called scorables. And how that works is you have scorable groups. So it's just very similar to intent uh, stacking, where I have a group, and as the message comes in, um, just like we saw the message handle, it'll send it to this root scorable dialog. And if it's a message, we're going to call continue with next group. If it's not, for this one, how I have it set up. This is the conversation handler. This is coming in uh, to say someone joined the conversation. This is where you say hi back. But you notice here I have an attribute of scorable group zero. So if I look at scorable group one, these are my reg regular expression patterns. So these are, if I have a command that says, uh, did anywhere in the sentence, did it say shop or show or whatever we've taught them. It'll go in this group, and then I'll jump out to other dialogues to do whatever needs to be done. And if I want to go to the next scorable group, I do continue with next group. If I'm done with their answer, I don't call that. Now, the next scorable group, uh, this is the second regex pattern, uh, are the Lewis intents. So uh, these are how you get back the Lewis intents. Um, so even though JSON's coming back from Lewis, you don't even have to deal with the JSON. Um, you can pull it programmatically in C Sharp. So you can see if the Lewis intent said reserve a table, um, then do that. And then you have the scorable group three, which is default, your catch-all. You know, one of the things I don't have here on the bottom, you can have another scorable group that has the Q&A maker to capture it. Um, and then everything else in here is uh, exactly as you'd expect in a, in a C-sharp project. Open. That was strange. So you can see I have a different class for um, if they want to survey, if they have a survey with the prompt. I have one for gathering the user information. Things we don't have time to talk about um, is middleware. Middleware allows you to Every, everything that comes through back and forth, you can capture that and do something with it. Um, something else that's implemented in here is um, proactive messaging. Again, proactive messaging allows you, once they talk to your bot once, you gather their information, and now you can talk to them. Now you've got to be careful with that, right? You want, don't want to annoy the user by proactively sending messages. Um, but you might want to do that. For example, um, some of the enterprise bots we've worked on is, uh, if you ever worked with Jenkins, it has, I think, just Slack integration. Uh, but we had a team that wanted to be able to kick off builds and figure out progress and be alerted when things were done with other platforms. For example, like if they went home, they didn't want to be contacted on Facebook Messenger or Skype. They wanted to be sent a text if it was after five and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that you can do with uh, these types of bots. And I'm going to actually end there, because I think we're out of time. But there's a ton more, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this presentation on bots. Thanks for having me.